Now, Britons aren't stingy. Privately, we give about £10 billion a year to charities. That's voluntary. Allowing people to choose who deserves their hard-earned cash. But David Cameron, a man who thought nothing of spending poor people's money, decided that, as a state, we should do more. Our foreign aid was written into law. 0.7% of GDP in today's money, about £15 billion. Well, a cons poll of Conservative voters last year found that 92% of them wanted that figure to be cut. Reasons? Our massive Covid borrowing, the fact we're giving away the AstraZeneca jab, and a sense that charity begins at home during the lockdown crisis. And maybe a suspicion, too, not entirely groundless, that not every foreign aid pound goes to truly deserving causes. It wasn't just Tory voters who felt and still feel this way. Two-thirds of Britons believe our foreign aid budget is too big. The government responded by proposing a temporary cut from 0.7 to 0.5% of GDP. Backbench Tories, like Theresa May, don't like that. Reducing foreign aid wasn't in the manifesto, they say, but then nor was Covid. Today, it's reported that Boris Johnson will seek to thwart an attempt to force a vote on foreign aid. He's in a pickle. The number of Conservative rebels is put at 50, enough potentially for the government to lose. Uh, the rebels point to a reduction in funding for polio vaccines, girls' education and humanitarian relief for Yemen and Syria. But how do they propose to find the £4 billion in foreign aid savings that Rishi Sunak, the Chancellor, has already divvied up and allocated? More importantly, how can we ensure that foreign aid is made to work in our national interest. Last week we discussed Britain's critical shortage of the rare earth metals needed to power our battery and electric car revolution. China has cornered the market. When China gives, it expects something in return. Is it really morally insolvent for Britain to do the same? Already there are signs the UK aid programme is getting a bit more hard-nosed. Aid to China, of all places, has been cut. More is going to East Africa, where the Foreign Office wants to curry favour. But politicians, especially Tory backbenchers, should think hard about what the public want. Otherwise, anyone who thought MPs were out of touch with the electorate during the long years of Brexit parliamentary trench warfare might conclude that they are at it again. Well, we're joined now by James Rogers, co-founder of the Council on Geostrategy, and Ryan Henson, Chief Executive Officer at the Coalition for Global Prosperity. Welcome. Thanks, uh, gentlemen, for both of you joining us this evening. James Rogers, to start with you first. Um, this is in the manifesto. It has to be delivered. Yes, that's in, indeed the case. It is in the manifesto, um, and I, I understand the uh, the backbenchers that want to ensure that the that the aid commitment is delivered. It was promised. It's been promised internationally. Um, COVID has uh, delivered <laughs> something of, of a kick both to the economy and to the country more generally. Um, so there is some understanding there that the government needs to make um, changes to the economic planning that it previously had. Um, but nonetheless, the 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 lo in the longer term, um, it's understandable that that Conservative Party MPs would want to sustain um, their manifesto commitment. Uh, Ryan, what do you say to those, two, not just Conservative voters, but all voters, two-thirds of whom say, we simply give too much at this time in the form of foreign aid? Well, I sympathise with it, and I sympathise because I am a Conservative voter, so I, I know exactly what the arguments are. But my answer is, uh, the problems of the world don't go away just because we're in the midst of this uh, terrific economic challenge. Uh, COVID is, is the best example of that. It's proven that viruses don't end at borders. So we can... Which is why uh, we're giving away the, the AstraZeneca budget. jab. Well, it's in our interest, surely, that uh, the, the people of the world are um, protected from COVID along with other diseases, because ultimately, if they're not, then those diseases and those viruses are likely to come to our shores. So it's in our interest to, uh, to do this, and it's in our interest to, to lead on international development. James Rogers, um, NGOs, charities, were depending on this money. They plan years ahead and suddenly they've got a big hole in their budgets. Yes, indeed. I mean, the, 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 the reductions are quite substantial um, from 0.7% uh, of gross national income to 0.5. Um, that's uh, around um, £5 billion uh, pounds because the UK's economy is so large, even though it's been hit quite substantially by the uh, covid uh, pandemic. So there's a significant amount of money that, that's no longer um, available. Now, this is important because uh, uh, at the same time, and this was highlighted in the government's integrated review, 
um, the international environment is becoming increasingly more competitive. And as you mentioned uh, in the intro, uh, countries like the People's Republic of China have amplified quite substantially their so-called aid programs. Now, they are not um, beholden to the same kinds of rules that we have subscribed to, those set by wealthy countries uh, to try and create some kind of similarity in aid spending. And that allows them to reach out um, and to capture often uh, elites in other countries, developing countries, and make them subservient to Chinese economic and political interests. So while we're at the, on the one hand suffering from the COVID uh, pandemic, and that's not just affecting us, but it's affecting many other countries, including development countries around the world, we're also moving into a period of geopolitical flux and competition um, where we're facing quite substantial uh, rivals. Um, and in that case, we need to really begin to focus our efforts more, I think, uh, coherently uh, to ensure that we not only help the world's poorest people and people that potentially will come under the influence of quite um, corrupt uh, regimes, uh, but also to ensure that we uphold our national uh, interests. And getting that balance right between those two components is critical in the, in the years ahead. Uh, Ryan, as a, as a Conservative supporter, what should those, I mean, it could be anything up to 50 Conservative MPs who want the aid budget to be the full 0.7%, how do they explain to their constituents that they are going to fill that four or five billion pound black hole? Which taxes do they suggest ought to rise? Which spending programmes ought to be cut? Well, look, it's a really tough job. And the polling that you referred to at the beginning uh, lays out the scale of the challenge. Uh, aid is not popular, particularly with Conservative voters. I think what it suggests to me is that it's incumbent, particularly on members of parliament, but on people like myself who support international aid, that we have to do a far better job of making the case for it. But what I would say to those Conservative MPs who will be speaking to sceptical voters in their constituencies is that there is a price uh, for not doing it too. And, you know, don't take my word for it. Jim Mattis, who was Donald Trump's defence secretary, a man with more medals on his chest than I've had hot dinners, said the less the State Department spends or the less you fund it, the more I have to spend on ammunition. So the consequences of the world's poorest regions will keep coming to the UK's shores unless we take action. And aid is one of the, uh, one of the best ways we can tackle those problems at their source so that they don't come to the UK and cause problems for the voters in the constituencies of the members of parliament who are rebelling. There's another view, James Rogers, isn't there, which is actually what aid does. People like Dambisa Moyo have made this very clear. What aid does over time is creates a, a dependency culture in the recipients and also the formation of a kleptocracy. Yes, I mean, there, there are arguments that have been put to that um, to that degree. And yes, there, to be frank, there is some evidence that in some countries uh, this this is is the case. Uh, whenever there are such large volumes of money involved, and it's not just coming from Britain, remember, it's coming from many different uh, wealthy countries in, in Europe, in North America, uh, Japan, Australia, uh, New Zealand, uh, and so on and so forth. When there are large volumes of monies and uh, money involved, that, that can be the, the, the result. Um, but on the other hand, uh, it's still important that the world's leading uh, democracies, the world's leading economies uh, play their part. Um, and there's another dimension to this, which is often overlooked, and that is that it's not just Britain that has reduced uh, its uh, aid spending over the last uh, year. Other countries are also planning to, that have also been hit by the COVID um, pandemic. And one really important point to make is that many of those countries have not reached Britain's spending levels, that 0.7%. They've been spending significantly less. So yes, there is an argument to be made that in the longer term, um, after we move out of this uh, pandemic and the economic consequences of it, um, that Britain should you know, increase its uh, spending uh, back to that 0.7% level. We also have to ensure that other countries do so too, and they are starting from a lower level. So one of the greatest things I think that Britain could do going ahead would be to uh, get international uh, consensus and put pressure on its uh, partners and allies in Europe, in North America, to get them to spend more so that the overall impact is uh, maximised. And while they're at it, they could also, or we could also um, coordinate more effectively to ensure not only that the spending is, uh, is, is coordinated to be maximum, maximally effective, uh, but also that it's targeted in a way that underpins our own national interests and the interests of democratic countries um, when we are moving into this era of, of intensified competition. 
And I made a reference to David Cameron, a rather rude reference actually to David Cameron, former Prime Minister, in my introduction there. But the point is, uh, some people get really annoyed when former politicians write into law, write into law rules which then future subsequent politicians have to enact, or not enact, have to deal with. It feels anti-democratic. The people who actually made the, set the ambition don't have to deliver it. I mean, I can, I can come in there. I, I share that frustration. I think uh, what I would say is that Parliament legislated and Parliament, should it take a call to revoke that decision by David Cameron, certainly can do so. But the current Parliament stood on a, every political party stood on a manifesto which committed to the 0.7. But the reason the 0.7 is so important and the reason uh, I suspect, or one of the main drivers behind David Cameron's decision to enshrine it in legislation, is that it, sa it says to the rest of the world, the UK has set the mark uh, and you should follow. We shouldn't be in a position where the UK and one or two other leading nations are the only ones hitting this 0.7 target. It should be something that other nations should be doing too. So it, it sets a clear marker. And it also says to the rest of the world, these are our values. You know, we spend 2% of GNI on defence. We spend 0.7% no, on development. It doesn't, does it? It doesn't, it doesn't say that. It, it says that's, these are David Cameron's values in 2015. They're not our values, which is why I was quoting those polls at the start. 92% of Tories hate the fact we give quite so much money away. Two thirds of all voters say we give too much money in foreign aid. It's, it's not their values. It's a, a small clack of politicians who want to do some national virtue signalling. Alternatively, we could say that the Conservative Party won a landslide election on a manifesto which was clear as day in saying that the UK would meet 0.7%, uh, the 0.7% target. Uh, so it can be looked at two ways. I appreciate that it's not popular. Uh, I appreciate that there is a real job to be done, not just by politicians, but by civil society in making the case for aid. But I nevertheless firmly believe that it is part of our values. It's something that we should be immensely proud of and it's making a huge difference. And that translates into soft power for the UK. It keeps us safer. These are not clear things to sell on the doorstep. They're complicated. They require explanation. It can't be done in a tweet, but it's nevertheless part of who we are. It's something we've always done. And I think, you know, if you think back to uh, the leadership role in the 20th century that the UK has played, whether that's being a founding member of NATO, of the UN, I wonder how popular they were on the doorstep, you know, in places like Hartlepool. But they were nevertheless the right thing to do. James Rogers, it would be a more popular and easy sell on the doorstep, wouldn't it, if you could say to people, look, we're giving this money to these countries. Look at what we get in return. I mentioned last week about the shortage we face as a country of rare earth metals. The Chinese have cornered the market there. When they give something, there is an expectation they get something back tangible and useful and not just goodwill. Yes, I mean, we, we have done a great deal of good over the last um, decade, and particularly over the last um, five or so years. Uh, the UK has helped to lift um, millions of women out of poverty, millions of people across Africa. Uh, the, the, the statistic is, is as high as 50 uh, million. So British aid has done a great deal of good, and that does, in fact, reduce um, uh, international uh, or, or improves international security and, and prevents, as Ryan said, some of those problems coming to our shores. But having said all of that, it is the case that we're now moving into, an, into a more uh, geopolitically volatile era where we're facing very stiff competition from powerful countries like China, like Russia. And we need to adapt our aid policy and integrate it into our foreign policy more effectively so that it not only helps the world's most vulnerable people, um, which I think we all actually want to do, but also that it actually underpins Britain's position in the world and makes it more influential and more powerful so that it can push back against those uh, dangerous regimes that seek to undermine our security and also to spread their message, to spread their way of government um, across the developing world. And that's the fundamental change that has to be made over the next few years. And that doesn't necessarily mean that we'll become less altruistic. It just means that we'll become more integrated. But the key thing is to try and link the two together. James Rogers, Ryan Henson, gentlemen, thanks both very much.